Open your Bibles this morning, if you will, to the Gospel of Luke chapter 16 as we continue our study. Now, as you know, the announcements ran so long last week that the sermon ran short. I only had about 30 minutes uh, and I went a little bit over, but you know, that's okay. So this is really sort of part two of last week's message. And because of that, I need to reiterate a few facts. First of all, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and the Pharisees have overheard, right? And he's told the story of the unjust steward. And he's making this point that you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, of course, mammon is a personification of wealth. It's a personification of money. And Jesus is simply saying, listen, you cannot have both God and material possessions as your first priority because you can only have one first priority. And the reality is, is if you love the world and the things of the world more than God, then you have made yourself an enemy of God because friendship with the world is enmity with God. Amen? So Jesus is making this point and he's making it very clearly. And the Pharisees, who the scripture tells us here were lovers of money, right? They derided him. In other words, they mocked and scorned and laughed and turned their noses up at the things that he was teaching. And Jesus responds to them in Luke chapter 16, verse 14. We see that the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things and they derided him and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. That which is highly esteemed, that which men, men, they look up to it, they, they worship it, they bow down to it, they prostrate themselves before the desires that they have, the things of this world. And Jesus is saying, listen, man, the world may look at those things and those behaviors and those attitudes and those actions and say, oh, wow, look at you, right? I remember when I was growing up, I had occasion to think of this the other day. When I was growing up, there was a, there was a TV show called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Do you remember that? How many of you all remember that show? And they glorified wealth, didn't they? They showed us the mansions and they showed us the cars and they showed us the boats and they showed us the incredible meals and they, they put on display for all of America, for all of the world to see how wonderful it was to be rich. And God looks at that attitude and he says, that is an abomination. Now, it was an interesting show and the stuff they had, it was cool. But the thing is, is if we love money, if we love wealth, if we love possessions, then we are setting ourselves up for some serious trouble. Because those things that we think we possess so often end up being the very things that possess us. Godliness with contentment, the scripture tells us, is great gain. May I say, it isn't how much money you have that matters, it's how content you can be with whatever you do or don't have that truly matters. And that contentment, when it is rooted and founded in a relationship with God, is the greatest wealth you can possess. Now, Again, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you are those who justify yourselves. We are great at justifying ourselves, aren't we? I mean, I think that most of us have a PhD in self-justification because we've been studying it our entire lives. You know, we throw throw a temper tantrum as a child and, and our parents call us on that temper tantrum and, well, why are you crying? Why are you stomping your feet? Well, I wanted to go first and they didn't let me go first and because they didn't, you know, it's always somebody else's fault. That ability to examine oneself and to be critical of oneself and to truly evaluate oneself is a difficult thing. It's difficult. I remember many years ago, and I'm getting off track with this, but many, many years ago, I was a Chick-fil-A operator working in Las Cruces, New Mexico, running a mall store for them there in Las Cruces. 
And we used to have operator meetings where the various operators from the region would come together and would visit one another's stores. And we would have our business consultant come in from Atlanta to sort of run the meeting. And, and then we would go to whoever was hosting. We would go to their store. We would sample their product. We would look at how things were running. And we would give one another feedback on that. Well, one day, we walked into my store, because I was hosting that day. And we pulled a sandwich from the drawer. And, and, and went over and, and took it apart and opened it up. And you know how that, how many of you eat Chick-fil-A, right? I mean, we're in Texas, y'all eat Chick-fil-A, right? And, and it's that golden brown, beautiful, crispy crust of that chicken, right? Well, this one looked like it was dark chocolate. It was literally the color of dark chocolate. And immediately, I knew I was in trouble. Because what had happened is my, my, my employees who were working, they had not properly filtered the oil. So what happens was when you don't filter that oil, those particles build up in there. And even though the food is not burnt, it gives it that burnt appearance and a slightly smoky taste. It's not right. It's not good. And so I knew I was in the wrong. I knew that there was a problem there. But what I didn't realize was how my fellow operators were going to react to it. And it was like there was blood in the water. And the sharks went into a feeding frenzy. And they attacked me so viciously that everything began to fall under criticism. Not just the sandwich, but everything. By the time we broke and went to lunch, I could barely breathe. And, and I remember excusing myself to go to the restroom, a man in my late 20s, because I didn't want them to see me cry. That's how rough it was. Well, after they left and I was back up in my office, I sat down at my computer and I did what you can imagine I might have done. I began to type my resignation letter because nobody was going to talk to me like that. Right? Now, that was just off. That They were completely out of line. Was there a problem with the sandwich? Sure, there was, but it was not an excuse for them to speak to me or to treat me in that manner. And how dare they talk to me like that? And I was ready to quit. And suddenly it was like the Holy Spirit said, now, wait a second, Ken, you can do that. You could get all mad and angry about what they said to you and how they said it. But if you do that, you're going to miss the opportunity to learn from this experience. If you make excuses and justify yourself and you fail to listen to what they said, you're going to miss the truths that were in their words, however harshly those words were spoken. And so I stopped and I stepped back and I began to evaluate and I recognized in that moment that I was in the wrong. Now, how they addressed it, sure, wasn't right. But I had no grounds to justify myself. And the problem that I had at that time in my life as a store manager was not the burnt chicken. The burnt chicken was a symptom of the deeper problem, which was I had not learned as a manager how to hold my staff accountable. I had given them pass after pass after pass. If they did something wrong, I looked the other way or just gently corrected them. I did not hold them accountable. And so even though they knew the standards, even though they were properly trained, they had no desire to do what was right or no impetus to do what was right because they knew there were no consequences if they did what was wrong. And I had to change in that moment and begin to become a better operator, right? And the lesson that that teaches me is accountability matters. And we as human beings need to be held accountable for the things that we do and do not do or else we're never going to grow in the direction that we were intended to grow in. And in order to learn those lessons, in order to grow, we have to reflect upon the criticisms that we receive, justified or unjustified, and stop justifying ourselves and rather listen to the truths that are being spoken to us. If someone has offended you, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the problem. If someone has offended you, it means that you need to examine yourself first. And so Jesus says to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. You see, they were more concerned about what others thought of them than they were about what God thought of them because they had a greater fear of man than they had of God. You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. God knows your hearts. Do you realize that this morning as you sit here today? God knows your heart. He knows those things that are done in the dark. He knows those whispers that enter your mind. He knows the sins that you dwell upon 
and he knows the weaknesses that you have. And here's the miraculous thing, given all of that. He loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The righteous for the unrighteous. The God-man for the ungodly man. You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men, the lifestyles of the rich and famous, right? That which is highly esteemed among men. No one's going to tell me what to do. No one's going to push me around. Don't tread on me, right? You give to me, I'm going to give you twice back. That attitude that is highly esteemed among men, that self-righteousness, that self-aggrandization, that self-importance, that selfishness, that which is highly esteemed among men. You deserve a break today, right? You ever been at the jewelry counter, trying on a piece of jewelry you know you can't afford, ladies? And the woman across the counter says to you, oh, go ahead, you deserve it. How many of you have had that experience? I know at least one or two of you who've been on the other side of that experience. The reality is what we deserve is hell, judgment, and damnation. That is what we deserve. The Bible tells us that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, the scripture tells us. You can't hide from God. You cannot fool God. What a blessing, what a comfort to know that he is for you, that he loves you, that he wants to redeem you, that he is longing for you to turn from your sin and turn to him, to lay down your arms and your rebellious hearts and to yield to his mercy and grace. C.S. Lewis once said, and this is not a direct quote, I paraphrase a bit, but C.S. Lewis was convinced that men will be rebels till the end and that the doors of hell will be locked from the inside. Right? What is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Now, Jesus uses a story to illustrate this point. And it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which we're going to read starting here in in chapter 16, verse 19. And there is great debate among biblical scholars as to whether or not this is a parable or a true story. And here's the point that I want to make regarding that. I could care less. Parable, true story, actually happened, just an illustration. However you slice it, the bottom line is these are truths that Jesus intended to convey to those who would listen. And there's nothing in this parable that he is saying that isn't absolutely true, whether it's a parable or not. Now, there are some good pieces of evidence that would indicate that it is not a parable. First of all, Jesus doesn't say it's a parable. Luke doesn't say that it's a parable, and typically we do have, and he spoke to them in parables saying, right? So there's no indication in the introduction to this that it is a parable. A second indicator is that Jesus, in all of the other parables, refrains from using names. This is the only parable that we have in which a name is actually given of one of the people about whom the parable is told, Lazarus. So there is every possibility that this is a story that Jesus is telling, that he is drawing from his omniscience, his all-knowing nature, that he knows that this is what is happening. Could it be a parable? Sure. But I want to set that question aside and just leave it there because ultimately there's no way to know for sure. And the bottom line is whether or not it's a parable doesn't ultimately matter, at least not to me. Jesus tells this story to illustrate. Now, we, another mistake we make is we'll look at this parable in isolation. We'll take the parable by itself and we'll just look at the parable without looking at the context into which the parable was spoken. Uh, most of you who know me know that I, I teach high school. And what I teach in high school is English 3, language and composition. And I teach rhetoric to my students. And one of the things that we look at when we study rhetoric is the rhetorical situation right? It's that little triangle. How many of you remember that triangle? How many of you remember those, those Greek words, ethos, logos, pathos? Anybody? Anybody have good teachers growing up? Anyway, uh, 
If you'd have been in my class, you'd know it. That's all I got to say about that. So in the rhetorical situation, there are a number of parts of that rhetorical situation that matter. There's the speaker, right? In this instance, who is the speaker? The speaker is Jesus. There is the message. And the message in this instance is that which is loved by men is hated by God. That which is exalted among men is an abomination to God, right? And so it's this love of money that he's speaking against. That's his message here. That you cannot serve God and money. That's his message. Now, who's his audience? Because it's important too. His audience in the immediate context of the scripture here are the Pharisees. And what is the Pharisees' problem? What are their, what's their problem? Their problem is that they were lovers of money who justified themselves rather than obeying God, right? Because they feared man more than they feared God. They were lovers of money who justified themselves. That was their problem. And so they are the audience, which means that the context, right, of this story is Jesus talking to the Pharisees and addressing this question of the love of money as opposed to the fear of God and the love of God. And Jesus is making a very clear point, and that being that the love of money will lead you down a path that ultimately results in torment. Let's read what he says. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus' evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides, all this betwixt us or between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, uh, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Let's break this down a little. The rich man is esteemed by the world. He wears costly clothing. That purple clothing that he wore was very likely worth its weight in gold because purple dye was incredibly expensive. It was the kind of fabric that would be worn by royalty. He fares sumptuously every day. Many people fare sumptuously on occasion, on a feast day, 
we fare very sumptuously, particularly on days like Thanksgiving and the 4th of July and Christmas, right? But this man, for him, every day was a Thanksgiving day feast. Every day he fared sumptuously. He had the richest of foods, not just on occasion, but every single day. As you can imagine, there was probably a great deal of waste in his home. There would be crumbs that fell to the table, crumbs and leftovers that could very easily be given to someone who is hungry. And Lazarus was right outside his gate, literally right there. And all he was asking for, not a place at the table, not a to-go bag of leftovers, just the crumbs that fell from the table. That's all he wanted. And yet, there's no indication that he ever received anything. Now, the poor man, Lazarus would be despised by the world. At the very least, simply an object of pity, right? Just an object of pity. Begging for crumbs at the rich man's gate. Full of sores, oozing sores that were licked by the dogs. Unclean beasts that they were. If given the choice of what you wanted to be when you grew up, and they held up two pictures of the rich man and Lazarus, there's not a one of us who would say, oh, dude, I want to be be Lazarus. Yeah, I want to be that. I want to be that beggar sitting outside the gate. That's my life's ambition, right? No. Who would we want to be? We'd want to be the rich man. We'd want to have the nice clothes. We'd want to have the good food. We'd want to have the nice car. You know, it doesn't go into all the details. Their standards of wealth were nice clothes and lots of food. What would we fill that in with in a modern context? A big screen TV that covers this entire wall, right? The latest gaming system, never mind the fact that I can't even beat the old one. I need the new one, right? Not one car, but two or three cars, because you know I can drive more than one at a time. No, I can only drive one at a time, but do you see what I mean? Those are our standards. I mean, come on, who isn't impressed by Jay Leno's car collection? I mean, that guy's got some nice cars. That is what the world looks at and says, that is success. You want to hear something? Something that took me a long time to learn? I look out here at all of you, and I say to myself, this ministry is a success. I don't need hundreds. I don't need thousands. We don't need to have a mega church to know that God has used us and blessed us and that the measure of our ministry is looked at by God and is pleasing to him, right? But the world says, oh, no, you need more people. You need to get out. The The world's focus is on the show, right? Professional worship teams and smoke and lights and you know, like concert-like settings for worship because they think that worship is about entertaining the body when really worship is about honoring the Lord, right? When we gather together and we sing songs to God, it's nice when it sounds nice, but ultimately, even if it sounded horrible, we're still accomplishing our purpose if we are worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. You know, the Bible doesn't say God is looking for those to worship Him with excellent lead guitarists, and amazing lighting. No, he says that the Lord is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not trying to be critical of some of those really big, awesome worship experiences. They are fantastic. I enjoy them. I love going to that type of a worship service. But you know what? That's not what it's about. It's pleasurable. It's pleasant. It's wonderful. It can be a great uplifting experience to worship in that kind of a setting. But ultimately, we can accomplish the same thing with a group of two or three people singing a cappella, lifting up the name of the Lord. Because it's not about you. It's not not about you. It's about Jesus. And it's about honoring God. So as we follow Christ we learn to measure success not according to the standards of the world, but according to the standards of the Lord. Amen? 
And so the next thing we see is that one of these men was rich and the other was as poor as you can be. One of them had it all and the other one had absolutely nothing. And the same thing happened to them both. They died. Both of these men, rich or poor, went through the same experience in that they passed from this life. Solomon refers to this in Ecclesiastes when he says, one event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good, the clean, and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As is the good, so is the sinner. What is he referring to? What is that one thing that happens to everyone? We die. We all die. I've got news for you. One of these days, should the Lord tarry and not return for his church before this happens, one of these days, you will die. This life is going to be over. That next appointment that was on your books, you're not going to make it to that appointment. That next assignment that you had to do, that next book that you wanted to read, that next thing that you wanted to check off your bucket list, it's not going to happen. Why? Because you will not be here and shock of shocks, the world will go on without you. It will. But that moment of death is where the commonality of their experience came to an end. Because what happened after that was incredibly different. One of them, the one that was despised by the world, the one who had nothing, he is carried by angels to a place that the scripture here refers to as Abraham's bosom and that is elsewhere in scripture referred to as paradise. Not heaven, paradise. There are a number of different references to what happens after we die in the scripture. The Old Testament tends to refer to that space, that temporal location in time and space and existence as Sheol. How many of you have seen the word Sheol when you're reading your Old Testament and you said, whoa, what's that? Some translations interpret it as the grave, okay? Shale, based on the word shale, is neither a good place nor a bad place, but it contained in Old Testament days both a good place and a bad place. The good place in shale or the grave was known as paradise or as Jesus refers to it here as Abraham's bosom. In other words, being held and comforted by Father Abraham. The other place in Hades was a place of torment and a place of suffering. Was it hell? Sure felt like it. Was it the lake of fire that we see in the book of Revelation? No, it was not. Did you know that right now the lake of fire is empty? According to the scriptures, right now there is no one in the lake of fire at least not so far as we know. So where do sinners go when they die? Where do those who do not believe go when they die? We are told right here by Jesus. They go to a place of torments where they await the final judgment. To put it in a modern context, this is like county jail where you go awaiting your trial. Is county jail a fun place? No, it's not a fun place. Are there torments associated with being in the county jail? If you don't think so, why don't you try staying there for a while? I speak not by personal experience, but I have visited people who were there and they didn't seem to like it too much, right? That lake of fire, that's the penitentiary. And there is a life sentence with no chance of parole that lasts for all eternity once you end up there. But this place where the rich man is, is a place of torment. 
And there are a few things that we can learn about that place. First of all, it is a place of fire, of pain, and of suffering. We also learn from this passage that those who are there still remember their former lives. They remember the people that they knew and they remember the mistakes that they made, which tells me that the emotional and psychological torment is just as bad as the physical torment. What's more, they can see what they missed. They could look across and see into paradise where those who have received their reward, where those who had faith and trust in God, where those who were no longer rebels but had turned from sin to God and were saved by the mercy of God are experiencing the comfort of God, which makes their current state in torment all the worse because they can see what they are missing. And the mistakes that they made are prevalent and evident before their faces. And they find themselves in a situation where they are no longer able to justify themselves. Did Jesus believe in hell? Did Jesus teach about hell? There are many critics today, and there are some people who call themselves pastors today that will teach that hell doesn't exist, that there's no such thing as hell. They will talk about heaven, but they will deny the existence of hell. I even saw one guy on the internet who claimed that Jesus didn't believe in hell and that Jesus didn't teach about hell. I got to wonder what Bible that guy's reading because there is ample evidence both that hell exists, that it is real, that you do not want to go there, and that Jesus both believed in it and taught about it. In fact, more than anyone else in Scripture, Jesus taught about it. I'm going to read to you just a few examples. Now, please forgive me. These examples that I'm about to read you are pulled somewhat from context, right? You can go back and research the context, but if I were to read each one of these in context, we'd be here till 2 o'clock this afternoon. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, we hear what John the Baptist had to say, and here's what John the Baptist said. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me, speaking of Jesus, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn." But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. A wise old pastor once said, if every sinner who was condemned to hell were to weep an ocean of tears, all of them together would not be sufficient to put out one ember of the fire in which they are burning. In Matthew 5, 27 through 30, Jesus says this. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. In Matthew 7, a couple chapters later, verses 13 and 14, Jesus continues, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him, referencing God, of course, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Did Jesus teach about hell? 
Yes. Did Jesus believe in the existence of hell? Yes. Did Jesus warn those who heard him about the dangers of hell? And if we as pastors and if we as Christian ministers and as we as believers who are bearing testimony to the world hold back because we're afraid of offending the sensibilities of those that are hearing us, we are doing them an incredible disservice. We talk about being saved. John MacArthur teaching on this subject says, yeah, but saved from what? Saved from a life of meaninglessness? Saved from aimlessness in your life? Saved from depression? Saved from anxiety? Saved from what? Saved from hell. That's what we are saved from. Salvation is what keeps us from spending an eternity in torment, in eternal separation from God. I was criticized a couple of weeks ago for saying that when you get right down to it, hell is just eternal separation from God. That is something I stand by. And, and the person who criticized that statement said, well, no, it's hellfire and it's damnation. It's all these, you know what? Yes. But eternal separation from God is even worse than those things. This last one, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. This is a longer reading, but it's worth it. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? He's, they're like, oh, Lord, we don't remember any of that. We never saw you out there, Father. You're giving us credit for something we don't deserve any credit for. The king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now, something I want to point out before I go any further with this. This is not the great white throne judgment. Many people look at this and they think that this is the great white throne judgment. It's not. This is the judgment of the nations at the return of Christ. And the brethren that are being referred to here are the Jewish people. When Jesus said, my brethren, he's talking about the Jewish people. He's talking about Israel. And he's saying to those nations that exist upon the earth at the time of his return that you either loved and supported and were kind to my people or you hated, rebuked, and, and, and uh, persecuted my people. And the judgment that he is passing here is on this. There are essentially three groups of people in this story. There are his brethren, which are the Jews, there are those who are the goats, who were those who hated them, who did not love them, who did not honor God, who did not love God. And then there are the sheep. Those are those believers who loved God and served him on this earth during the time of the great tribulation. These are these two different groups of people. Now, there are other potential interpretations of this verse. I'm not going to be dogmatic in my explanation of it, but if you want to know what I think, that's what I think. Then he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire. How long does that fire last? Forever. It's everlasting fire. Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire 
prepared for the devil and his angels. Was that lake of fire ever intended for mankind? It was not. People say, well, a loving God wouldn't send people to hell. The reality is God never intended for us to be in hell. God intended for us to have fellowship with him. But because we were rebellious, our state became the same state as those of the angels who rebelled. We were rebels. You're like, well, I never rebelled. Well, have you reconciled to God through Christ? Well, no. Well, then guess what? You're rebelling right now. Right? And what is, what is going to happen here? Let's read. Then he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, what are they going to do? They're going to justify themselves. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? If we'd seen you, Lord, oh, we, those others, not, we didn't help them. But if we'd seen you, uh, we'd have helped you, right? Then he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, there are those who, out of a sense of finding comfort for themselves, believe in a doctrine called the annihilation of the soul. Has anyone ever heard of the doctrine called the annihilation of the soul? Well, it's out there, and there are people who teach it. And what they're saying is, is that, those who have rejected Christ, those who go into hell, those who are condemned to go into the lake of fire, that they will burn in those flames for a period of time commensurate to the evil that they did in this world. They will suffer torment and persecution, but once they've paid that price, they will cease to exist. The Bible doesn't teach that. Jesus didn't teach that. It's a comfortable lie. It's a lie that makes you feel better about those who have died rejecting Christ. But the Bible doesn't teach it. We can't make up doctrines just to make ourselves feel better, folks. We've got to be honest about what the scripture says. And it says here that these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal punishment life. Listen, there is a choice that is set before each and every one of us. It's a choice that each and every one of us must make to either receive Christ or to reject him, to either receive God's mercy or to justify ourselves and say that we don't need it, to either submit ourselves to God or to continue to think that we ought to be in charge of our own lives. There are those who love God and want to be with him for all eternity. There are others who hate God and don't want anything to do with him and just want to be left alone. One day Jesus is going to to come back and he's going to give all of them exactly what they wanted. For those who want to be with him for all eternity, they will get to be with him for all eternity. For those who wanted nothing to do with him and didn't want to be near him, they will be cast from his presence. But there is no one who will be cast out who didn't make that choice for themselves. Now, what happens now when we die? If we die as an unbeliever, as we die as someone who has rejected Christ, we do not go to the lake of fire. We go to Hades, to Sheol, to the grave where we, as the rich man in this story, will experience torments until the time of our judgment comes. But what about Christians who die? What about believers who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior and are living their lives for him? What happens to them when they die? Are they carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom like Lazarus was? And the answer is no. Paradise, as it was at the time that Jesus told the story, I believe, and many biblical scholars believe, is now empty. It's empty. So what happens? Let's look. 
When Jesus was hanging upon the cross, and one of the two thieves who had been ridiculing him recognized the error of their ways and said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied and said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He did not say in heaven. He didn't say today you will be with me in heaven. He said today you will be with me in paradise. So at that time, before Jesus died, the destination that we went to as believers when we died was paradise. But now we know that that's not where we go. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, Paul writes this, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? And the Lord Jesus is no longer in the grave. Where is he? He is in heaven seated at the right hand of the Father. And when we leave this world, we go to be with him where he is. Well, how did that happen? We have a couple of indications in the scripture. Turn with me quickly to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. We're going to be quick on these. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. says this, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he, this is speaking of Christ, ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So what did Jesus do when he descended into the depths of the earth before he was raised from the dead? What did he do while he was there? Second Peter chapter two, turn with me there. Second Peter chapter two, verses 14 through 19 tells us this would help if I was in 2 Peter. I'm in 1 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse, oh, wait a second. Oh, I think I made a mistake. Hold on a second. 2, 14, or 1, 14. 1 Peter, there, hold on, I think it's in 1 Peter. It was really late last night when I was writing these notes. I might have a typo. First Peter 2, it's not that one. Let's check 2 Peter 2. Come on, Ken. <laughs> okay, I don't know how I got it this way, but it's it's First Peter chapter three, verse eighteen. My notes were completely wrong. First Peter chapter three, verse eighteen. Here's what we, we read: For Christ also suffered once for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who were formerly disobedient when once the divine longsuffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved Through the water. So the idea here is that Jesus went after he was crucified and buried into Hades, into the grave, and proclaimed liberty to those who were captive there and led them back to heaven in the presence of God with himself, thereby fulfilling what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to ask you to turn there with me. A little bit of a Bible drill today. 
Boy, that threw me off not being able to find that space there. My apologies. That's what I get for making my notes after midnight. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Hmm. I did it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes, For we know, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this, that is this body, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent, in this body, groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, in other words, not because we want to die, but further clothed, in other words, we want to be more alive, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us, which is a deposit of the life that we will one day experience in fullness. So verse 6 says, We are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well-known to God, and I also trust are well-known in your consciences. So Paul has made it very clear in his epistles that when the believer dies, we leave this world and we go to heaven where we are in his presence for all eternity. So what does that mean? Before Christ died, the sins of the world had not been washed away. The payment had not been made. So those who died in faith prior to the crucifixion could not go and be in the presence of God because they were not yet cleansed from their sins. The blood of the sacrifice covered their sins, but the price had not yet been paid. And so they had to be kept in this place, which is referred to in the scriptures as paradise or Abraham's bosom. But now that the price has been paid, we enter directly into the presence of God. I'd like to think we're still carried there by the angels. I'd like to think that. Whether or not that's the case, who's to say? But we know that when we close our eyes in this world, we open them in his presence. Amen? Now, the plight of the unbeliever, and let's call it what it is, the plight of the rebel against God, because that's what an unbeliever is. You know, we have it in our hearts. We're like, oh, well, how could God send people to hell? These are not just people we're talking about. These are rebels, they are people who are living in defiance of God. Now, some of them we know and love. And guess what? God knows them and loves them too. In fact, he loves them more than we do. He loved them so much that he died for them. Are you willing to die for them? Some of us aren't even willing to talk to them about this because we're afraid that they will reject us. But he loved them so much he was willing to die for them. So we can never think that it is a lack of love on his part. It is persistent rebellion on their part that puts people in this position. So what happens to them? At present, they are held in that place that we refer to as torment or Hades. They are in fire, they are in pain, they are in suffering. They remember the life that they live. They remember the opportunities that they could have had to turn from that sin and receive the Lord. They are no longer able to justify themselves. And they would want nothing more than for someone to go and tell their friends and family members about what is going on. Those who died, listen to me, those who died in their sins, those who are currently suffering in hell, want you to evangelize. 
they want you to go and tell their loved ones the truth about Jesus so that their loved ones don't end up in that place as well. I once had to do a funeral for a man who I knew was not a believer. And maybe he was, maybe, maybe somewhere in there, you know, but, but he had rejected God every time I'd ever come to know about it. And, and yet it fell to me to do his funeral service. And I remember saying, if this young man were standing here today, he would tell you to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. He wouldn't have said so in his life, but he now knows the truth, and he would tell you to accept Christ today. It's a true statement. There are no atheists in hell. They might have been atheists before they got there, but once they're there, they know the truth, and they're no longer able to justify themselves. So what's the point that is being made? There's more that I'd like to read to you. There's more that I'd like to share. I could take you to Revelation chapter uh, 20 and read about the great white throne judgment and read about the lake of fire into which those who have rejected Christ, those who accept the mark of the beast, the beast, the antichrist, and ultimately the devil and his angels will all be cast into. You can read that for yourself if you'd like, but the reality is the Bible teaches it, it's true, and it is in the future of those who are currently held in that place of torment. When they stand before the judge and the books are opened and the book is opened and their names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they will be cast into the lake of fire. But there is no one who has to end up there. We all have the opportunity to be saved from that fate. Jesus came to save us from that very thing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is the good news. But let's be honest with ourselves. There can't be good news if there isn't also bad news. And the bad news is that those who reject the good news will one day have to give an account for it. Let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, we have been confronted today with the reality of hell. It is my prayer, Lord, that no one within the sound of my voice would accept that as their future destiny. But that each one who is here now each one who is watching online or listening on a podcast, wherever these words are making contact with their hearts and minds, Lord, I pray that they would recognize their peril, that they would recognize the danger that they are in if they continue to rebel against you. Lord, I pray that every person within the sound of my voice would be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, that they would lay down their rebellion, that they would turn from their sin, and that they would turn to Jesus, who died to pay the price for that sin. Lord, save them, and thank you for saving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.